<laughs> Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we air part two of our conversation with Dr. Amber Boydston, Associate Professor of Political Science at UC Davis and author of Making the News, about how media influence framing and attention. In this segment, we explore social media and our own behavior as media audiences and consumers, as well as people connected to other people in communities. Welcome, Amber. The COVID-19 pandemic and U.S. federal response have laid bare some of the challenges and shortcomings inherent in our societal and governmental systems. We're learning that Blacks and Latinos in the U.S. have borne the brunt of illness and death in many communities, that people of color may not be as privileged as whites when it comes to job security or the ability to social distance and stay out of harm's way. At the same time, there's a presidential campaign season upon us, and all sides are working to frame narratives advantageous to them. There's wrangling about how and when to put people back to work and get the economy going again. This is not unprecedented, but it's, I think, made more acute these these divergent narratives against the backdrop of this of this political contest that we're in leading up to the presidential election in the fall. And that's because we know from lots of political science research that one of the best predictors of who will win come November is how the economy is doing. But it also, of course, is going to matter how the president handles this particular crisis. And so probably different scholars would would have different opinions about about what the most advantageous frame is, depending on whether you're a Democrat or a Republican political actor. But there's definitely there are definitely going to be frames that for given constituency bases are going to work um, better than others. And so we've got that sun layer of of politics that that is under um all of this in a way that that is even sharper than it normally would be. It's true. We are in this moment where we're dealing with a public health crisis. The election also is a very real thing. And even though it feels like it doesn't exist right now, it is coming uh, unless the election is postponed, which hopefully that won't happen. Um, But it is a real thing. And you're right. The actors in this, some of whom are responsible for our public health and safety, are also players in the election game. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe another indicator or predictor of election success is whether there's a war going on or whether we are actively engaged in uh, unrest. And and so I'm hearing a lot of frame or a lot of uh, verbiage and and framing about we're at war with this virus and and all of this because framing framing oneself in that way can tie into the something that has been proven successful in the past and you can correct me if I'm wrong about that yeah that's certainly right that that when uh, when we are a nation at war a nation in crisis we do tend to have that rally around the flag effect that is generally advantageous for whoever is in office, assuming that they handle the situation well. Good point. Good point. We've talked a lot about traditional media, you know, gatekeeper media and the people in positions of leadership and power. I want to talk a little bit about social media because social media is also a place where we're I think for probably a lot of us living more of our lives there if possible than we were before because we're at home. What else do we have to do? And so I wonder if people are spending a little bit more time in their social media spaces. And social media is a place where sort of all bets are off, right? It, depending on whom you follow, what you've liked, what, you know, the, the information coming at you might not be vetted at all. And that's... I don't know if it's a game changer anymore. It's been around for a long time, but that is an element to the information and misinformation flow and how this pandemic has been framed for people. That is, I think, a third player in this framing game. I agree with you that that social media is, I, I don't know the statistics, but I'm guessing that people are using social media more right now than they were before the pandemic because we're all shut in our homes with no one to uh, to talk to except people on Zoom and people who live in our in our same household. And it it offers an invaluable way to feel connected to the outside world. And as you say, it's a breeding ground for misinformation and disinformation, which seems especially problematic in this kind of pandemic. It I mean it's always problematic, right? I'm thinking back to 
after September 11th, if we had had the same type, the same reach of social media then as we do today, I would probably be arguing that that misinformation and disinformation would have been just as as challenging and dangerous for for citizens and for democracy uh, there. It feels different, not worse, but different in this case because the misinformation and disinformation on social media uh, would lead not only to instances of of racism and xenophobia, but also maybe individual people making bad choices about how to protect their own their own health. So I guess I guess that's all to say that my sense is that right now we're seeing an amplification of both the best of and the worst of of what social media has to offer. You bring up a great point. Social media is a lifeline in a lot of ways in a time like this. Uh, we've got Zoom, we've got our phones, we've got the person inside our house, and we've got those we can connect with on social media. And so from a social connection perspective, wow, it's an incredible thing. Uh, but I do think it's interesting that um, that it's playing a role in 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 how things are framed and how the traditional frames are viewed. Social media and the information and misinformation that gets bartered along inside that space can color how I look at a politician, how I look at a news outlet, how I look at a piece of information that comes at me, which otherwise wouldn't have had a value. And so you're right. I, you know, I think you, you said it, you said it really well that it's likely um, providing the best and worst of what we need at this point. One of the nice things about social media is that there's no paywall access, that it's available to anyone who has a smartphone and a data plan, which is not everyone, but a lot of people. But it's worth noting, I think, that it's disproportionately not used or underused by older, um, at least in America, by older Americans, which means that it's it's certainly not an equalizer in this in this time period that that those people who are because of their age demographic have been identified as people who are most susceptible to this virus and so who should be staying at home the most those are the people who who we should probably be most concerned about from a social fabric perspective because not only are they not able to to come into physical contact with people in the same way that they used to, but they also are less likely statistically to have that social media uh, fabric to, to shift to instead. So I'm, I'm thinking about my mom who has been self-isolating and she's now at, I think, three weeks without any physical contact from another human being. And she's an introvert and so she's fine with that, but, but even she, I think, is starting to yearn for some social connection. She's not on Facebook. She's not on Twitter. And so other than phone calls with, with friends and, and family, uh, she doesn't have that. She can't, she doesn't or can't pick up her phone and, and shift Twitter to, or Facebook to, to be, to feel connected to people in the same way that I can. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And it's so important to think about that. And that's why media isn't always the solution or it isn't always the end all be all. I work with a couple of organizations that think about social fabric. One is an organization called Civity and the mission of Civity is to connect people across socially salient differences. And one of those is difference in age, uh, people who might be isolated during this time and finding ways to connect. And that's not a mass media endeavor. You know, that's a person by person endeavor, which is a very different thing than the larger scale framing. That's a very different thing. Yeah. But if my mom were here, she would be quick to point out that as horrible as this pandemic is, and of course we wish it wasn't happening, that she has been pleasantly surprised to see fewer people walking by her house when she sits on her porch with their heads in their phones. And she's seen much more of a community presence where people are leaving signs for each other in their yard or drawing sidewalk chalk inspiration messages uh, to us. So it also does seem like this might be a tiny shift culturally for us where where we're maybe starting to make some of those neighbor to neighbor in person uh, pieces of communication that we were less likely to to make a couple months ago. So if people are doing better about reconnecting with their in-person communities, do you think we might see the same or a comparable trend on social media? From a scholarly perspective, it's an interesting type of social media, 
event to watch unfold because unlike a lot of other crises, there is an opportunity for a sense of solidarity in a way that um, that there was during 9-11, but that other kinds of a big media storm events like the Michael Brown shooting or um, maybe even Hurricane Katrina, that this is one of those rare instances where everyone who's on social media is affected or potentially affected by this by this crisis in some direct way. And so I'll be interested to see going forward whether I'm sure that there are really smart scholars out there um, thinking right now or not thinking, maybe chasing after their kids, but then at some point they'll start thinking about about different ways of categorizing the encounters on social media. We tend to think about about political communication as being what are we talking about? So what are the topics that we're talking about? How are we framing them? What's the tone that we're using? Are we being positive? Are we being negative? Are we being partisan? But I think there's some potential lessons to be learned here in what are the conditions under which people on social media seem to rally around these messages of support and inclusivity and encouragement? And what are those moments, um, what are the conditions under which there are online bullying, either around uh, the xenophobia, around the types of language that have been used around this uh, virus, or it was fascinating to me to watch the social media event unfold about the video compilation of of John Lennon's Imagine song that Gal Gadot uh, put out. I just actually assigned that as a case study to my students, the reaction to that versus the reaction to John Legend. Oh, that's really interesting. So I think that there's a lot to be unpacked there in how humans in this crisis situation, at least as as demonstrated on social media, how is it that we that we can move so fluidly and so quickly between those moments of, of uh, rallying together and banding together and those moments of vilifying one another. I mean, I, I completely get the, the criticisms about the, about the video, but it was, it was fascinating to watch. I agree. And it was, it was surprising too, because so many people have come out to, to do that, to sing songs. And that one just got roundly criticized. I guess what I would say to that is maybe that provides us with a little bit of glimpse at normalcy, right? Oh, look, the internet's still the same. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, look, people are still chowderheads. Yes. Yes, Well, thank goodness. I'm I'm glad that some things are still the same. Yeah, phew, good, good. But but it is fascinating because, uh, you know, someone like John Legend and and basically what, what my students are exploring is, what John Legend has done for his communities and and that he brings that to the table when he sings for people. And the Gal Gadot video, you know, people are like, hey, that's tone deaf. What have you actually done? Or, you know, I mean, it was it was fascinating to me. And and yeah, but I think, uh, hey, good old Internet, you're still there. <laughs> Thank God. You're still uh, there. <laughs> yeah. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. Today, we're talking with Dr. Amber Boydston, Associate Professor of Political Science at UC Davis and author of Making the News about how media influence framing and attention. In this episode, part two of my conversation with Dr. Boydston, we're exploring social media and our own behavior as media audiences and consumers. What's your take on the continued Democrat versus Republican framing in the media? Part of me expected that this would transcend politics a bit. And there are some people doing that, but the political frame seems to really be holding strong. I do think that it's really interesting that we're seeing the politics as usual in in both politicians trying to strategically frame situations, but also the journalists picking up on what the literature would call the game frame. So the, you know, the horse race, like blue versus red. But the other thing I'm thinking of is the process of of self-selecting into what news we uh, we look at. And there's a great book called Niche News by uh, Talia Strab on this. And that process of, of filtering our our news, of, of self-selecting into what type of news we want to see, that's always problematic, whether you're on the left or the right, or even if you just pick to only get your news from CNN or only get your news from the New York Times. But it's especially problematic, I think, right now because this crisis is unfolding against the backdrop of these political maneuverings. And so I haven't done a careful study of comparing what types of information people are getting from MSNBC versus Fox News, but I can't imagine that it's the same. And when 
when the information is so important, it, uh, it bears noting that, that this kind of self-selection is, I think, putting into sharp relief just how problematic that, that new selection uh, can be. Yeah. The New York Times did, they've been working with this great uh, GitHub data to, to do maps of the United States that I'm sure you've seen. And one of the maps was looking at cell phone data to, to track which states slowed down at which states started to stay home more and which states um, continued to travel as as normal at different points in time as this pandemic has become more and more of a reality. And it was hard for me not to, in my brain, to superimpose the electoral college map onto that, that map. So I just, I wonder to what degree people are getting different information on different sides of the of the aisle. You know, I, I have to say I have the same concern. And it's one thing when it's politics and political wrangling, but this is life and death. And I, I have friends and loved ones who tune into conservative media, such as Fox News. And, you know, I hear it straight from them. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's just like the flu. No, it's not. Or, oh, you know, the, there's not really a shortage of, of, of supplies in the healthcare workers. They're just hoarding. And the, the narratives are coming straight from this sort of conservative media space. And I think at a time like this, like I, I would say, look, I don't think we're trying to be partisan here. There's actual data that shows that staying at home is going to help lessen, you know, help flatten the curve, help help us deal with this crisis a little bit more easily. And so the persistence of the red versus blue, Democrat versus Republican in a time when we're talking life and death, I I I, it's interesting how hard it is for us, and I say us because the media is made up of us, and I am a member of the media as well, but how hard it is for the media and us as a society to set aside the political uh, binary frame that we've placed on everything. And I, I worry about that. I do worry about about that because I think it makes us less able to deal with complex issues in a nuanced way. I think you're exactly right. And, and I guess I would say that I don't know what it would look like to have non-political coverage of this, of this crisis. And that's because anyone who's also still paying attention to the presidential election has to be thinking that there are different ways that this crisis can unfold that will be more or less advantageous for the president and thus more or less advantageous to, um, to Biden. I would love the world in which all of us are just seeking the information that is best for uh, both our public health and our economic health. But the truth is that some pieces of those information, probably differentially on the public health side versus the economic side, are going to be more and less. Uh, there's political capital in there and in the decisions that we make and what and what happens. So um, I think it's going to be really interesting to you know, from a very dark perspective to, to see what happens as we've seen the president shift his narrative from um, from casting the virus as something that is imminently controllable, talking about it certainly more as a crisis. So I'm sure that the news media on the right will pick up that narrative, will shift that. Um, but I think about the political strategists who are inevitably circled around um, Trump's re-election campaign and, and Biden's campaign and they're thinking, I'm sure, about what are the scenarios under which the country is going to see, oh my gosh, there's this crisis and the person in charge has not handled it appropriately. We need someone else. And how would the situation need to look differently in order for the majority of the country to say, oh my gosh, we're in a crisis. We need to just stick with, we need to not rock the boat. We need to stick with the person who's in charge under that rally around the flag kind of mentality. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And in the context of that, I am following various people on Twitter to sort of watch what happens. And I have to say, you know, Biden is speaking up on Twitter. The tweets are smart. They're, you know, they're they're relevant. They're they're in the moment. This moment in a lot of ways is made for Bernie Sanders because he's been preaching public health care all along and he's got the ability to say now look if we had that i think things might be a little bit better but even still they're they're not governors you know they're not 
Governor Newsom or Governor Cuomo or other governors of other states who are able to demonstrate leadership in this moment. Uh, that you know that they don't have that official capacity and so i think that they are not sure how to find a way into this moment or at least that's been my that's been my conclusion based on what i've seen come across i think that your instinct is right and they face the same kind of concerns that we were talking about earlier that they don't want to focus on the doom and gloom um, too much, but they also don't want to make it seem like they're making light of things. Now is not the time where Americans are going to be amenable to being asked for campaign contributions, for example. And so, yeah, they have a, a challenging tightrope to walk. Um, the other thing that is relevant to this conversation, but that I also wanted to bring up in general, is that there's some initial uh, work, not enough yet, but there's some initial work on how uh, how numbers and statistics get communicated through political communication and how people react differently to information when it involves uh, statistics and specifically when it involves forecasts and and basically we're not we're not good as humans at at understanding probabilities um, and there's uh, at least initial evidence to suggest that that differs between the left and the right, or rather, not always, but now in 2020, there's a greater degree of respect for science and scientific findings among liberals than there is among conservatives. And so that means a couple things. That means that probably we're going to be seeing divergent narratives between MSNBC and Fox News, even in this uh, world where President Trump is is acknowledging that this is a crisis, but also that that Biden is thinking really hard, or their campaign strategists are at least, about to what degree do they tether their narratives to science? Oh, that's very interesting. I hadn't considered that. And wow, that's fascinating. I wonder if there's going to be any movement on the right when it comes to the value of science, given this current moment? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. But it's interesting to ponder, and I'm going to watch for that. Yeah, absolutely. You brought up us, uh, the, the, the audience, the viewers, the people who consume the content uh, from politicians, from the news media, from social media. What is our responsibility here? How would you recommend that the the uh, the people sitting here consuming this content deal with or navigate these frames every time i teach a media and politics class i give my students um what i like to think of as an inspirational speech but they probably think of more as a school marmy lecture about the importance of diversifying their news sources i think that 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 lesson would would apply here in this context uh even even more so that we should be as citizens, at least to the degree to which we can afford it in terms of money and in terms of time, we should be we should be reading lots of stories, we should be watching lots of things, we should be watching MSNBC and Fox News to have a sense of what people in different pockets of the country are are seeing. We should be uh, reading trusted news sources like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and um, listening to NPR but we should be diversifying our news sources. Um, and, and in doing that, I mean, the hope always in doing that is that you can hear things from different angles. But for example, um, if you're someone who, who traditionally uh, just reads news sources that are aimed at the upper echelon on the left, for example, you might be thinking about the public health frame or narrative in a way that doesn't allow room in your brain for the very real and serious considerations of gig workers who don't have health insurance and they don't have another job to go to and their option when no one is taking Uber or Lyft uh, rides, for example, anymore is is nothing. They don't have any other income to, to fall back on. And so, of course, they want to hear more about, or at least, of, of course, they want everyone to be thinking not only about the public health concerns, but also about the about the economic concerns. So diversifying those news sources would, I hope, make, again, I'm thinking about, you know, someone like myself who is privileged and has a paycheck and, and can self-isolate with relative uh, comfort in my house. 
uh, I'm hoping that diversifying news sources would make me, for example, more likely to think about those businesses that I normally frequent that I'm not frequenting and think about whether the guy who teaches my dad piano lessons every week, they've stopped the piano lessons, but, but if I can afford it, I should still be paying the guy who gives my dad piano lessons because he doesn't have another way of making income right now. That's an important point. It's so easy to know and consider only our own circumstances or to just pay lip service to healthcare workers, gig workers, or those who can't make any income right now without really understanding the depth of their plight. Or maybe we feel powerless to really do anything meaningful about it. There's talk at the federal level and even among some governors about pathways to reopening the economy, transitioning from the shelter in place. And I wonder how that can happen sooner rather than later in a way that doesn't put lives at risk, but that also ensures people can support themselves. I wonder if it can happen by summer or if we can be on the other side of this anytime soon, especially given that we've got a census that needs to happen, a pending presidential election. I think it'll be interesting to see whether or not we're on the other side of the pandemic by the time that we get to the election. And I don't I don't think that we will be. No, you're probably right. And so I don't think that we'll move the election, from my understanding, that's constitutionally very difficult, much more difficult than moving a a state primary. I don't know what is going to happen, because Biden is going to be having to make a case that there's a crisis and that we need new leadership, but that simultaneously, I think that, that President Trump, if his people are smart around him, they're probably also going to be coaxing him assuming that we're still in a pandemic, to be emphasizing the fact that we're in a crisis and we need steady leadership. So it's going to be an unusual fight where both candidates want to be talking about the same basic issue, and they'll even probably want to be framing it in very similar ways, uh, namely focusing and framing it as a crisis, not framing it as as being something that is sunny and, and rosy. So that'll be terrifying to watch. (laughs) Yes, yes, it will. And I think this will also uh, play a role in who Biden chooses as his VP candidate, uh, because I think before the crisis, he might have been favoring someone like a Kamala Harris. But given the crisis, maybe he wants someone who's more forward on the public health narrative, even though that's not necessarily his thing. I think that that's right. And what popped right away into my brain is um, who's the author of uh, Don't Think of an Elephant? Oh, uh, Lakoff. So I wonder if Lakoff would say right now that one of the things that differentiates the frames that the parties use is the degree to which they want to seem paternalistic or maternalistic. So I just flashed on thinking about how, how in this time of a crisis, but specifically a health crisis, I wonder if in some ways the Democrats, just from an ideological ethos point of view, would have a slight advantage in that it's in this type of crisis, unlike warfare, where we want to feel protected. And you're right. Like right now, we want to be cared for. But also, if I, if memory serves, Lakoff uh, writes about the notoriously bad track record Democrats have with messaging. And Small absolutely. <laughs> So in this moment when Democrats really kind of have a few softballs, I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure that they'll be able to meet the moment and communicate to the American people. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that they that they can or, you know, I'm saying they the party can. But um, but, you know, historically, it has not been a strong suit of the Democratic Party. Agreed. We've been talking with Dr. Amber Boydston, associate professor of political science at UC Davis and author of Making the News. This was part two of my interview with Dr. Boydston. To hear part one, go to newsincontext.net. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing News in Context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Twitter at News in Context SF, And you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening.